and uh, you're welcome, Alison. It's a great pleasure to have you here in Constance. And uh, thank you, thank you all for coming. So, Alison Barker studied uh, biochemistry at Brown University in beautiful Rhode Island, mm -hmm. and from where she decided to do a PhD in in the study of the neural bases of larval zebrafish behavior. Where she moved to Herbie Bayer when he was still in San Francisco. Then. Harvey Bayer moved to Munich. She followed Harvey Bayer to then complete her PhD studies. This is where we've met and overlapped and uh, had great discussions about uh, a lot of things and which actually probably triggered me to move into the zebrafish field. Then she decided to actually that Lava zebrafish is a very boring system uh, and completely radically switched uh, gears and moved on to uh, explore social behaviors in uh, native oil rent colonies which will be the topic of our talk today. And then after being at the Max Planck, no, at the Max Delbruck Center in Berlin with Gary Lewin, um, she then got an offer from the Max Planck Institute of Brain Research in Frankfurt, where she now, um, six months ago, uh, yeah. started uh, her own lab to kind of explore the details of social communication in these colonies, developing new tracking techniques, and uh, very excitingly so, kind of going back to her passion in, in circuit neuroscience, Kind of now combining uh, combining these two fields and going to bring some neuroscience to the study of social behavior in this uh, fascinating system. So welcome, Edison, uh, to Constance, and uh, we are all looking forward to your talk. Um, thank you, Armin. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's um, and a very nice introduction. It's uh, a real pleasure to be here to talk about my own research. Um, and so I'm just going to um, get into it. And so today I'm going to tell you, um, as there's been a lot of buildup about the naked mole rat. Um, but first, I want to provide a little background about why one, or especially I, might look into the naked mole rat. And so one of the sort of fundamental motivating questions from my research was to understand how vocal communication helps organize social groups, and ultimately how this can drive cooperation. And so we were really interested in looking at this intersection between complex social behaviors and complex vocal behaviors. Um, and we know, um, for example, that there are many species, including our own, which are very good at these um, sort of specialized vocal behaviors, such as language. And um, if we um, also look, take a broader evolutionary approach, um, we see many of these um, similar intersections between complex sociality and vocal repertoire, also in the non-human primates, in elephants, in, in dolphins, uh, just to name a few. Um, but then this gets at my second um, sort of motivating question, and that's to understand the neural circuits um, that are specialized to both encode and decode the social information, especially that which is in vocal cues. And so when we move forward and we try and look at this, this transition to understand you know, where in the brain um, uh, specializations have occurred that allow for this intersection, uh, that becomes both ethically and technically difficult um, in some of these species that I've mentioned. And so that's what drew me to uh, this creature right here, the naked mole rat. Um, and so um, you're going to see a lot of naked mole rat photos today um, and some videos, um, so get ready. Uh, but here is here's the first uh, introduction to the naked mole rat. So this is a subterranean rodent uh, which is endemic to the eastern part of Africa in uh, the countries of Kenya. Kenya, Somalia, and Ethiopia. And despite the name, they are neither a mole nor a rat, um, but they're actually a small rodent. Um, and so what's great about them is they're roughly the size of a mouse, so between 30 and 50 grams. And from a social perspective, um, they have an incredible uh, colony organization. And so they live in these underground tunnels. Um, and you, ca you can see in this very nice illustration here. And in the wild, although there's limited studies of them, um, it has been reported that some of these colonies can contain more than 300 members and span a distance of more than one kilometer underground. Um, and then finally, naked mole rats are incredibly long-lived. Uh, so the oldest mole rat that we had in Berlin was, um, I think, 34 years old at last count. And so this also puts another demand on the social structure where new members have to be constantly integrated. Um, and they have to know their role and know how to uh, communicate with one another um, over a longer time period. Um, and so I should say that naked mole rats are also um, the only uh, one of two eusocial mammals. Um, and they have this um, very elaborate uh, social structure, which is commonly found in the social insects, so bees, ants, and wasps. Um, and I'm just diagramming this here um, in this kind of cartoon form. But basically, the way that naked mole rats uh, 
society is organized is that there's a queen, which is the single reproductive female. Um, there are defenders, there are a series of workers which um, are responsible for the acquisition of food and shelter. And what is really um, sort of key from, from my perspective in, in looking at this animal is that all of these tasks need to be coordinated within the larger unit um, for this colony to survive. And so um, also naked mole rats are, uh, can be housed in the lab quite well. And so here you can see my first colonies uh, in the basement of Frankfurt. Um, and so we can recreate these um, underground tunnel systems and these uh, plastic transparent um, tunnels. And um, it's actually really fun to watch. I just want to point out that this is not sped up in any way. This is actual real time movement. Um, and so I'm just going to give you a few other glimpses of what naked mole rats in the lab look like, and then this is going to highlight some of the features about their behavior, which I'll discuss in a minute. Um, so here you can see um, on a side view um, some of these interactions which you might have um, observed in the, um, in the previous video, and you can see when two naked mole rats interact in the tunnel, the more dominant one will climb over the other. Um, and this becomes uh, very helpful later for determining the um, hierarchical uh, structure, and then here you're going to hear some naked mole rats. So uh, naked mole rats are also incredibly, oops, um, incredibly vocal, and I'll get back to that in a second, but I just wanted to highlight that, um, so here again you can see a still frame from this interaction where um, two mole rats are encountering one another in the tunnel, um, and this, these crossover events are actually highly predictive of the rank um, over time, and that's what you're seeing here on the right. Um, these uh, rankings are very stable, um, and they predict the queen. So we can uh, perform uh, these uh, in a pseudo-random order to um, track the um, hierarchy of the colony over time. Um, and then finally, uh, naked mole rats are highly vocal, as you've already glimpsed in the first uh, video there. Um, and so I'm going to talk specifically about one type of vocalization today, but I just wanted to give you a little taste of the different types of uh, sounds that naked mole rats make and in which context. So on the top here, you're going to hear um, a courtship song, which is uh, from a male. And on the bottom here, you'll hear um, a more aggressive exchange between two workers. Um, and so I also, so the naked mole rats also vocalize in our frequency range. So this is actually what I hear when I'm doing the experiments, uh, which makes my job incredibly fun. Um, and so when I started in Gary Lewin's lab in Berlin, um, he had several colonies. Um, and there had been previously a paper uh, published in the early 90s looking at the naked mole rat dictionary. Um, but I wanted to... Um, investigate this a bit more, and so I spent a lot of time trying to decipher different sound types that the naked mole rats used. Um, but today I'm going to talk about just one particular vocalization, the so-called soft chirp. Um, and for those of you that are not familiar, I'm going to be presenting all the, uh, the sound data as a spectrogram, which is just a, a transformation of the sound wave um, into its frequency components over time. And uh, what you can see here in the schematized version of the soft chirp is that it's an actually a fairly simple sound, uh, which has a, a fairly symmetrical uh, upsweep and downsweep over time. And I should say that the naked mole rats, um, we think, make at least 25 distinct vocalizations. Um, the soft chirp is the most commonly used vocalization, and it's commonly used as a greeting call, so especially in these exchanges when they're crossing over in the tunnels. Um, and so the first question that we wanted to ask was then, do soft chirps convey some sort of social information? Um, and so to do that, we uh, created a pipeline for uh, analyzing tens of thousands of soft chirps. And so we uh, exploited several um, features of, of machine learning to come up with some automatic pipelines. Um, and if anyone wants the details, we can talk about that later. But I just want to highlight the general workflow here. Um, so we took um, several features uh, from the sound wave itself, so features such as pitch and Wiener entropy, which are commonly extracted uh, and used for bioacoustical classification. Um, and then we also did a lot of work uh, on the spectrogram itself. Um, so we're able to um, transform the sound wave into uh, a spectrogram, and then we uh, traced uh, the first harmonic of the soft chirp and then extracted some additional features such as the, the peak frequency of the soft chirp, um, the duration of the soft chirp, and then we could fit a slope to the, um, we could fit a parabola to the soft chirp and then we uh, extracted the slope of that. So um, in all told, we had eight features that we looked at. 
Um, and I just want to highlight that all of this um, is uh, publicly available, all the code and all the data. If anyone wants to play with it, uh, please check it out. Um, OK, so then I said that we had these eight sound features that we extracted. And then so what we did with them is we trained a, a type of machine learning algorithm called a random forest classifier. And the idea was that if there's some information in these eight features um, that is predictive of certain um, social uh, features, uh, that the machine might be able to then uh, use this information to uh, make predictions about the identity or um, other features of the soft chirps from animals that it had never seen before. And so what you can see here is kind of a representation of this. So what we did is we uh, split the data into a, a test set and a, a training set. Um, and then we asked if the classifier that we trained was then able to predict the, the actual individual identity of different animals within the colony. And so you can see along the, the y-axis here, uh, this is the true identity of nine different subordinates in this colony and the queen. Um, and then on the, the x-axis here, you can see um, the actual true identity. And so along the diagonal, um, it's the uh, fraction of correct responses. Um, and so I just want to highlight that since there's 10 options, if the classifier was performing completely at chance, uh, it would have a 1 in 10 chance of being correct. And so we can see that the classifier actually performs very well, um, suggesting that there's information in these eight sound features that is predictive of the individual's identity. Um, and so we looked at two other colonies as well. Um, so uh, a smaller colony um, and then another colony of 10 individuals and these results held up. And so then we were also interested in looking in if the soft chirps might encode other features. Um, so we decided to look at colony identity. So the naked mole, for the naked mole rat in their normal uh, lifestyle, the colony membership is very important for them. So what we did here is we looked at four different colonies. We again did uh, our feature extraction. And this time, since we already knew that the trainer um, sorry, that the classifier could be trained to recognize individuals, we made sure that um, individuals from each colony were not in the training and testing data set. And then we performed the same experiment. And so we found, again, quite to our surprise, um, that we had a very nice prediction rate. Um, and so just. Um, before we go further, I just wanted to, to share a fun fact. So we um, actually named all of our colonies after Game of Thrones houses. Um, so I'm going to go back into that uh, nomenclature there. So if any of you are fans, um, this maybe adds another dimension to the talk. Um, but um, yes, so we'll continue with that. So uh, we were so what we showed first, which was quite interesting, sort of from a an information perspective, is that there is potentially um, sound features within this one vocalization that can predict information about individual and colony identity. But we actually had no idea if the naked mole rats actually use this information, and this became a very important question. Um, so to test that, we uh, did some behavioral experiments. So you can see on the top here um, a schematic of the behavioral setup, uh, which was quite simple. So we had uh, three interconnected chambers. Uh, the naked mole rat was placed in the center chamber um, and had a choice of moving into the um, two connected chambers, each which had a speaker and a microphone. So we could both play back uh, um, audio information and then record what the animal responded. And so um, what you can see here on the left is first we just looked at the place uh, preference. So where did the animal prefer to spend time? Um, and so we found that actually the animals per, per, sorry, preferred to spend time uh, in the chamber where there was uh, uh, soft chirps uh, or in, in actually artificial sounds in general. Um, but it, they didn't seem to have a preference based on the colony playback. Um, and so that was a bit unexpected. So we decided to investigate this a bit further. Um, um, and we looked at when the animal responds. So here uh, you can see in the center panel, um, what I'm showing is a, a set of experiments done on animals from House Targaryen. And you can see that uh, when we played the House Baratheon stimuli, which is indicated by the, um, the black arrow, we don't see any responses. Um, the same when we um, present stimuli, stimuli from another colony uh, Dothraki, but when we present uh, stimuli that were recorded from the animal's home colony, so here on the bottom, um, we see consistent responses um, that are very temporally synced to the stimuli. And so we, of course, quantified this over many colonies um, and many animals, and we found that the result was quite robust. Um, so what you can see here is when we compare the response rate uh, to a sound from the home colony versus the foreign colony, uh, the response rate is much increased uh, for the home colony stimuli. 
So this suggested that the animals were actually able to recognize members of their own colony, and this drives a specific behavioral response. Um, however, this didn't tell us if the animal is actually recognizing the specific individual, um, because these were sounds that were recorded from the colonies, um, or if they were recognizing something more specific about the colony, um, what we're calling colony dialect, so specific features of the soft chirp for each colony. Um, so to test this, we made a series of artificial stimuli. And so here we manipulated just two of these features um, that we originally used in our classifier. And so you can see this uh, in the inset up here. So we looked at the peak frequency of the sound, um, which is the, the maximal frequency of the first harmonic of the soft chirp. And then we also looked at the asymmetry, so the difference between the start and end frequency of the sound. Um, and I'm just plotting these two um, here so you can kind of see the difference. And so. Um, we made, for example, one, here's the example of one artificial stimuli um, that was still characterized as belonging to House Baratheon, um, but did not overlap with any individual in the colony. Um, and then we could test this um, as well on our, our classifiers, and we found that indeed all of the artificial stimuli that we then tested behaviorally um, were uh, predicted to belong to the, in this case, um, colony Baratheon. Um, so here's just a behavioral result where we were able to confirm this. So in the first panel, you can see that we tested this again. Um, so this is a new colony, and we tested actual playbacks from colony members. Um, then we also tested the artificial stimuli, and you can see that the animal also consistently responds. Um, but when we test artificial stimuli that um, for another colony, uh, this response is gone. Um, we also uh, dissected this a bit further, and so we looked at single features, so just the peak frequency um, or just the asymmetry, and in, um, we found that in some cases there were responses to um, the, the peak frequency when that was matched to the average of the colony, but um, the asymmetry um, did not seem to be sufficient alone to drive behavioral responses. Um, so you can see all of this uh, summarized here. Um, and I, I just want to highlight that um, uh, this worked in multiple colonies. And then um, finally, what we also um, tested was whether or not um, uh, vocal cues or auditory cues alone were sufficient. Um, because of course, social communication is a multimodal um, is a multimodal stimulus um, or in, in the wild or actually in the lab, so in, in any social interaction. Um, so we, we basically tested um, sense from another colony and played back uh, vocalizations from the home colony. And while the response rate, um, while the animals were worse at this task, uh, performed worse at this task, um, the result was still there. So this suggested that um, even in the presence of a conflicting olfactory cue, uh, the animals still are able to recognize um, the vocal uh, dialect from their own colony. Okay, so um, then this raised a series of very interesting questions, um, the first of which were, um, how might these vocal signatures be maintained? Um, and so we, um, we had an interesting situation that occurred in the lab uh, where we had a series of, of colonies in which we lost the queen, and actually one colony in particular, um, which <laughs> kind of fortuitously was named House Stark before this happened. Um, but I was doing long-term uh, recordings from this colony, and we had a period um, where there was a stable queen, um, and then she was murdered, and then uh, we had another queen that rose, and then she also died. Um, and so what we were able to do over time is look at periods when we had recordings of, of the soft chirp uh, dialect when there was a queen and then when there was anarchy. And so we again uh, trained our, our classifiers to, to look at this and what we found was quite surprising is that when there is a queen, the all overall cohesiveness of the dialect, and which is reflected in the, the ability of the classifier to accurately recognize it, um, is much higher. And when we transition to phases of anarchy, um, this goes almost to chance levels. And so uh, we can look at this in, on, a, on a more uh, individual level. And so what I'm showing here again are just two of these eight features. So the peak frequency uh, plotted against asymmetry. And we had four subordinate individuals, which you can see um, uh, the, the, vari the variability of their soft chirps um, in subsequent periods of anarchy and when the new queen arose. Um, and I think it's quite clear that when the queen is there, the overall variability of the um, of the soft chirps of an individual is um, much uh, decreased. Um, so um, then we um, we also wanted to 
to know then, well, how are vocal signatures learned? So at what point um, in the life of the animal do they um, um, learn these uh, these vocal signatures, and I think this is an important question because the queen experiments show that there's some plasticity, it seems, in the adult or some ability of the vocal signature to change. Um, and we wanted to kind of look at a, a more developmental uh, perspective and see when this arises. Um, so we did some very classical uh, behavioral experiments where we had some foster cross-fostering experiments um, where we moved a series of pups early in life uh, to another colony. Um, in this case, we had um, two pups from House Stark, which were, were orphaned during one of the queen overthrows, and so we managed to move them into two separate colonies, and then we could track uh, their vocalizations over time, and uh, using these classifiers that we could previously train, uh, sorry, that we had previously trained, uh, we could then ask um, what uh, dialect, what soft chirp dialect are they using later in life? And so we tested these after a six month uh, period. Um, and so you can see here that um, both of the pups that were moved from House Stark to one of the other colonies um, in the end um, ended up using the vocal dialect of the adoptive colony. Um, we also had, we were able to perform this experiment a third time. Um, and I should just say that these experiments are actually quite difficult to do because we can't synchronize the breeding of the colonies in the lab. So we, in fact, got very lucky that we were able to have simultaneous litters. Um, so in this experiment, we were able to move one pup into another colony and simultaneously uh, track uh, the vocalizations of, of siblings, uh, foster siblings. Um, and again, we found, uh, maybe not surprisingly, that the two colonies that were born in um, House Martell ended up speaking uh, the Martell dialect. And also, um, the pup that was transplanted um, from the Targaryen colony uh, also ended up speaking the Martell dialect. And so this suggested that this um, this use of dialect is not uh, a purely genetic uh, feature, but something that actually uh, can be learned. And the extent of this learning is something that we're still actively investigating. Um, but I just wanted to show you then here just a quick summary. So um, yes, all the, uh, all the foster pups ended up using the dialect of their foster colony. Um, we had uh, just a little, uh, a few more tidbits of, of interesting data. So we had later um, another colony where we lost a queen, um, and we found that this actually uh, held up as well. So because we didn't have subsequent periods of queen loss, um, we couldn't test this across um, periods of anarchy and queen, but we could ask the question, well, how does the classifier perform uh, when, compared to the other colonies uh, when there's a queen and when there's not? And you can see the same effect here quite clearly that when uh, one of the colonies loses its queen, uh, the ability of the classifier to uh, distinguish its uh, dialect falls apart quite rapidly. Um, and then we could also look at this on the level of individual uh, jobs within the colony. So if we look at the variability of, of the queens across multiple colonies or the breeding males or some of the subordinates, I think this is actually one of my, my favorite results is that you see that actually despite um, the fact that each colony has a very clear kind of um, separation in terms of the features that they use in the soft chirp, the breeding males consistently have the most variability. And I think this kind of makes sense when you think about some of the other vocal behaviors that they do, uh, because they're constantly singing to the queen. Um, and then one, finally, one other question that often comes up is people ask, well, how, how is this um, dialect determined? So um, one hypothesis would be that individuals are always trying to match the queen. Um, so we tried to test that a little bit by, again, going back into our data set. Um, and instead of uh, training, uh, using a training data set, which took into account like half of the population of the colony, we instead just trained the classifier with either the queen or a single subordinate. And we, we asked how well then the classifier performed, and the, the hypothesis was that if everyone was matching the queen, if we used her vocalizations to train the classifier, it would perform much better. Um, and in, the f in fact, in the end, um, it seemed to be pretty consistent across all the colonies. Um, one of the colonies was more separable than the others, um, but it didn't seem to matter if it was the queen or the subordinate um, that was trained. Um, so I just want to then conclude uh, with this part. So this work has already been published, and um, then I'm going to talk about a few things which, which haven't been published yet. Um, so uh, what we showed is that naked mole rats um, use vocalizations, specifically the soft chirp, to communicate individual and colony identity. 
um, that in fact these uh, colony dialects are quite distinct and that they can drive different behavioral decisions, um, so this response or no response. Um, we have some evidence that they can be learned and finally, we have evidence that social context is important. So when there's a stable queen, um, this uh, is also reflected in the stability of the dialect. Um, so uh, moving forward, sort of the directions of my own lab, we're really now uh, trying to move into the brain and understand how the social identity is determined. Um, and so uh, I was hoping that we would have some data here, but um, instead just um, this, is, this is the direction for the future. So we're hoping to begin um, by starting to image in the auditory cortex and ask how different vocalizations, uh, either from different colonies or from the queen or the worker or even the individual own vocalizations, how those are represented on a neuronal level. Um, and we're also interested in understanding how this social identity is maintained. So we know that um, the vocal, when the social structure falls apart, this is reflected in the vocalizations. Um, and so now we want to look at this on a, um, a more detailed level. Level We want to look at sort of social network analysis to understand uh, which individuals are talking to each other and how uh, these dynamics change uh, when the queen is lost. Um, and so for the last few minutes, I just want to uh, shift gears and talk about another project that we're trying to finish up now. And this is um, work that I'm still continuing uh, with my postdoc advisor in Berlin, uh, Gary Lewin. And we were um, interested in not only so how these dialects are used, how they're maintained, but how did they evolve? And so I think that the naked mole rat, as I mentioned, is uh, belongs to a family of African mole rats. You can see the phylogenetic tree here. Um, and across this family, um, there's very different social behaviors. So the naked mole rat um, is youth social, um, so is the Damarlan mole rat, um, which um, you can see here, um, it, which is found in the Kalahari. Um, but throughout the family, then are, there are also many other species that are solitary. And so if you kind of look at the evolutionary history of the family, um, it, it's um, it, it can, we can kind of map this or follow this and, and look at the ecological niche and we can also look at the behavior of animals um, along the eastern coast of Africa. And so uh, with some collaborators at the University of Pretoria, we've had um, access to uh, many of these animals um, to do both vocalization recordings and then also some um, uh, neuroanatomy. And, um, Basically, the, the main hypothesis that we had is that when we look at this family, uh, we see um, increased sociality. And so we hypothesized that this uh, increased uh, cooperation, this increased uh, sociality would be accompanied by increased vocal communication. Um, so that in this way, um, the Bathyergidae family would be a powerful model for understanding the evolution of the social brain. Um, and so uh, we, we also thought that this expanded vocal repertoire um, as is going to be reflected in the underlying neural circuitry. Um, so, but first a very obvious question is then how is this implemented? So, um, you know, what, what does one begin to assay? So you could imagine that they might have more sound types, they might have different modulations of sounds, different usage rate or different usage context. Um, so we spent a lot of time um, making recordings from some of the other species. And so I'm just going to show a few of them to you today and just give you a little taste of the data. Uh, so this is Fucumus damarensis, the Damaraland mole rat. This is the other eusocial species. Um, and so I will just play some of the vocalizations for you and you can see if they sound similar or not. Okay, and then here's another example. So I think you know they sound a bit different from the naked mole rats. Let's see. Okay, then um, this is a Cryptomys hottentot despertoria, or the high-filled mole rat. This is actually local uh, to the area where we work in South Africa, um, and this is a, a moderately social species. They live in a group groups of about six to to twelve, and so here you can see here some of them. Okay, and then finally the last one, um, this is Bathyergus suilis. So this is quite a large animal actually, they're roughly the size of a rabbit. Um, and uh, they are solitary, um, but they do sometimes make vocalizations. And then here is one example. Okay, so we uh, we spent a lot of time with these animals um, and we got a lot of uh, 
vocalization recordings, which we're still analyzing, um, but I just want to give you some of the, the quick highlights. Um, so what we found um, is that the vocal repertoire does increase with sociality, not as much as we thought. Um, and I'm not sure that you can fully appreciate this here, but there, um, these are the main sounds on the bottom here of um, the adult naked mole rat vocalizations. And we actually found much more overlap than we thought. Um, but the, so for example, Damarensis we think has about 14 vocalizations, whereas the naked mole rat has about 17. Um, and we're still, um, so we've validated, we've classified all of these manually, but we're now looking at sort of unbiased clustering techniques. Um, so I'm gonna resist giving a final number, but we do see um, that the naked mole rats tend to have more sounds, um, but, um, this was actually not the, the most, uh, we actually expected the result to be more dramatic. Uh, what instead we found is that the vocalization rate uh, increases a lot. So here what you're seeing um, over a period of about three hours are vocalizations um, from four individuals. So we managed to have a very small uh, naked mole rat colony of four individuals, and we, we matched this in size to the other species. Um, for the solitary species, we, we put them in pairs and then merged the data. So basically, we are looking at the vocalization rate of four animals um, across time. And you can see on the top that the naked mole rats basically never stop vocalizing. Um, which is which is quite remarkable, I think. And then if we, we quantify this, so if we look at the uh, vocalization rate per minute, again, the naked mole rats are um, really quite striking. Um, and I think this is kind of interesting when you think about this from an evolutionary perspective. I mean, they're drawing a lot of attention to themselves. They're also, um, it is metabolically demanding to be vocalizing all the time. Um, and so this suggests that there's some very significant reason that they do this. Um, and then we can break apart which type of vocalizations they were using. And maybe not surprisingly, um, the naked mole rat is using the soft chirp um, predominantly. Um, and so we're still trying to investigate what exactly that, that means. Um, um, but one other approach that we've taken is we now are looking at, at the brains of all these individuals and we're looking um, at um, what changes um, in terms of neural activity when they have sound exposure both to uh, neutral so sounds and social sounds. And so here's the naked mole rat brain where you can see some uh, CFOS staining, which is a, a marker of neural activity. Um, and so we start to see um, specializations, um, which is actually quite nice. And so my very... Um, my very ambitious student is uh, working on this uh, still in Berlin. We now have brains from the other four species, and she's um, and we're going to try and map um, differences in neural activity um, in response to social stimuli, and then also in collaboration uh, with the uh, with Katja Novak's group at the FU in Berlin, um, we have. Um, made a, a, a de novo transcriptome for some of the species, um, and where we've sequenced. Um, different levels of, of our mRNAs that are active in different brain regions. And so we're doing, um, we just, this is the most recent result. Everything has been sort of successfully annotated at the moment. And so now we're looking into different gene expression changes um, across brain regions. Um, okay, so with that, uh, I wanna thank um, a lot of people. Um, I wanna thank uh, my um, advisor in, in Berlin for introducing me to the Naked Mole Rats um, and my two fantastic students there. Um, and then a host of really amazing collaborators throughout the world, um, our, our funding sources, and then also um, the Max Planck Institute uh, in Frankfurt for giving me the opportunity to have my own group there. And then I think there's time for questions. <laughs> Yeah, I would love if that was the case. So we don't actually know. There, there is a lot of fighting. So I can comment on um, uh, generally when there's an overthrow and it's successful, um, the uh, the new queen kind of ascends very quickly and she orchestrates the overthrow um, as far as we can tell. But in um, House Stark, for example, where we had the two queens lost, um, they still to this day don't have a new queen. Um, so I think normally in the wild then they would disperse and try and form new colonies. Uh, in the lab situation, yeah, they're kind of stuck together. So 
Uh, but that's a fascinating question, right? Like, how do you decide you want to challenge for the queenship? What changes in your brain to make that happen? How do you coordinate that? Um, these are all things we're very keen to, to figure out. Thanks. Hi, thanks for the great talk. Um, so I have so many questions, but I'm taking you to lunch. <laughs> so I will, I'll, I'll just ask one for now. Um, for the queen as well, I was wondering um, if you had looked at, like you, you mentioned that the idea that maybe the other members of the colony are learning the dialect from the queen. And then you also mentioned there were some times when the queen changed. So I was wondering if you looked at um, what happens when individual, like when a colony gets a new queen, like does, is there a distinct dialect? Um, and can you like maybe use those natural changes to see, yeah, and, and also does the, the queen's uh, dialect change when she becomes queen? Uh, um, yeah, I think, well, so yes to the first question. We have looked at that. We, like, we had this idea that maybe there's this template language that they all go back to and they, it just gets messy and then, then the queen like brings them back on track. And we think that that's, that's not the case actually. So um, they seem to have sort of a new dialect. Um, I, I, we really have to do more experiments to kind of play with this to really figure out what exactly is changing. Um, and I, I feel like one thing that we really need to do as well is look at the other sounds. So we're looking at one, um, one vocalization. Yes, it's the most commonly used and it's like very important for this um, recognition and this exchange, but I suspect that um, what's changing when an individual becomes the queen is that they learn to use these other vocalizations as well. Um, and do they learn or is this innate? How is that? I mean, that's something that we're also very interested in because there are certain vocalizations that only the breeders use. Um, and we don't know to what extent that that's inherited. So still an active investigation, but yeah. Cool, thanks. I'd love to chat more. <laughs> hey, thanks for the wonderful call. Um, Two questions, actually. One is very quick. Um, just wondering how you keep track of the individual identity. And the other one is uh, with these dialects. Um, what do you think they're useful for in the wild? Like, how often do the colonies actually encounter each other? Like, how is it important for them to know which, where they come from? Or, yeah. Um, yes, so the first question, uh, we use RFID chips. So all the animals are subcutaneous subcutaneously implanted um, around six months. Um, and so um, we, we can track that, which is which is quite easy. Um, yeah, and then this this other question, I'm, I'm really glad that, that you asked this because I love giving this answer because I think we don't have a clear answer. So it's something I think about all the time. Um, one idea is of course, yes, that you might want to use it as a control for strangers. So to say, okay, if, if a new animal is coming in, there's some sort of metric for identification. Um, we don't know that much about these interactions in the wild. I mean, they, they do happen. And especially when a new colony will split off, that might be one way that helps them stay separated. Um, but I think that there's another hypothesis that's equally interesting and that this may be some sort of measure of internal conformity. So when you want to have everyone who's like, you know, following the rules very closely, you want to make sure you have these like checks when you interact with everyone that no one is being too, I don't know, fun or, or you know, they're, they're, they're all following the same exact rule and the vocal output is a quick way to make sure that everyone's in line. Um, and so I think that that might be also one way that it's used. Um, Did you, do you see that an individual that's a bit of an outlier in terms of vocalization gets molested more or something? <laughs> Um, well, there is one really cool um, naked mole rat like subtype that I didn't talk about today called the disperser morph. And so there are individuals who will uh, go through this metabolic change. They get like a really fat neck and then in the wild they will like try and uh, leave the colony. And um, they, they, are, they also happen in the lab. So we've had a few that have escaped and <laughs> tried to do this. Um, and so, yeah, that, that is, um, I think when we have a few more of those over time, we can look and see if the, um, if their dialect is um, is changing, but I don't have an answer for that yet. But thank you. Hey, thank you so much for this fascinating talk. Um, I had another question about the um, maintenance of the dialect when the queen is gone, because you mentioned a few things about the breeding males that they're second in the hierarchy and that they're constantly singing to the queen and that they're also the most distinct in their soft chirps. Do you think it could be the when the queen is gone because they stop singing, that's what causes the derivation in the whole colony? Oh, um, 
I mean, that's an interesting perspective. That's I usually I think of everything as female centric, that it's all about the queen, but it could also be male centric. Um, yeah, I think that that's possible. I don't know how um, how often the other individuals hear the courtship song. I mean, and when you think about in the wild, this, these tunnel systems that could be one kilometer, that might not be enough to get the transmission through. But I think um, your instincts about the males being outliers are, are very helpful to think about um, because they're, si they're sort of immune to this uh, conformity. Um, and they're also, I, I mean, I think this has been shown in, in birds, for example, that there's hormonal changes uh, in in brain regions that are responsible for singing. Um, and so I think that um, this may be happening in the naked mole rats as well. The males are, and the queen are the only ones that have these high levels of reproductive hormones circulating. And so we suspect that when this suppression is lost and we don't actually know how that's working, that maybe these hormonal changes are also happening as well. And so that's why we see more of like a male phenotype in the other animals. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that wonderful talk. That was really, really impressive. Um, <laughs> I'm particularly interested in the evolutionary comparison. And you know, to be open, that's something we're also very interested in in, in my group. Um, and I, I'd love your thoughts on whether you think the evolutionary process is equipping these different species with the machinery to perform all of these vocalizations. And then that's called upon differentially, which would be reflected in, I guess, your CFOS kind of approach, mm -hmm. or if um, evolution has driven novel neuroanatomy that allows for increased repertoire size. Because just eyeballing one of the graphs very quickly, it looked mm -hmm. like there were massive differences in the usage of the different types of communication um, and maybe entire deficits, which is sort of what we see in the fish, that some lineages just cannot perform some behaviors that seem to be very important in social organization. Hmm. Um, yeah, I think we should definitely chat more about this. I think this is a, yeah, this is a question that I, I, I constantly think about, like how much of this is a neuroanatomical change versus like, um, yeah. So, and, and so we don't know. Um, I think that that's easy to check. We can get the, the larynx out of these animals and we can make some predictions about what type of sounds are possible. Um, that's kind of something that's on the, the back burner. Like when I find the right like neuroanatomist or like sort of you know vocal track anatomist to help out with that. Um, but I, I think um, that's why this this like this whole family is so great because there's actually not that much divergence on an evolutionary time scale, and so. Yeah, and, and that's why I was kind of surprised that there seemed to be, like it seems possible that um, certain species can make these other sounds, um, at least that they do, but they don't use them. So actually, I'm just kind of spiraling here, but I, I don't actually know. And I think that this is why we're looking in the brain and why we're going to keep doing everything. And I would be surprised uh, and happy with either result. I mean, I think that that's, um, and then of course, this is just a rodent model. And, it, and it's great to have a broader perspective where you can look across different species. And that's, yeah, that would be the dream, so. <laughs> Can I just quickly follow up? Can you produce deficits by sort of the wolf child syndrome by by um, oh. rearing individuals in isolation? Is that um, I mean ethically with a rodent? I suppose that's an absolute nightmare. No, actually, no. I mean, I, I'm happy to say that we we do have now approval to do this sort of. So we will isolate them in smaller groups, um, and that is one experiment that we definitely want to try. Um, not just the isolation, but also um, a different sound environment, um, either white noise or you know doubling the frequency. We really want to see what the extent of the vocal plasticity is, and yeah, maybe getting back to your first question, that's an area where it's 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 acted maybe there's just more plasticity and and we do know actually from other studies in the naked mole rat that they do have like periods of of um, neurogenesis which are longer i mean they're also very long lived so these things might all be linked um, they might just have a, a longer um, plasticity uh, range or period uh, in their brain so yeah cool. thank you thanks Thanks, that was a great talk. Um, I was curious to hear your thoughts about kind of the quantity of information being transmitted within a system and how that relates to the frequency of vocalization, particularly when, at least in the naked mole rats, what you're seeing is a massive increase in this one call type. And I was curious, I, I, I was just thinking on the lines of like, if you're constantly vocalizing yourself, you're not necessarily hearing 
it just seems like a cacophony of vocalizations. And yeah, I'm curious really what you is, think yeah. about the informational content of that. Um, yeah, this is um, this is a fascinating question. So we we're playing around with this as well, like kind of the social information transfer within a vocalization. Um, we, we have a very improv, impoverished preparation, actually, where we're just looking at one vocalization, and we're actually mostly looking at spectrogram features. So to do that, we're going back to the raw audio data, and we're going to and we're analyzing that. I think this is why we need better behavioral tracking over time to look at all of these interactions. Um, and um, we did this because it was, well, it's kind of the easy first approach. Um, but I think that's exactly one direction that we want to go in. And I think this is, at the same time, why it's really cool to go into the brain as well, because we basically have this kind of cocktail party effect all the time where the animals are having these conversations on top of each other, but how do they know which conversation to attend to? Um, and of course you can model that, but I also really wanna see what the network dynamics in the brain are while this is happening. Um, so very cool, but yeah, I don't know, ask me in a few years and I hope we have an answer. <laughs> Janine Grütter asks, uh, Dear Alison, thank you for this great talk. It was, I was wondering how long it takes for a naked mole rat to learn the new dialect. Does that also depend on age, as with children, where we know that they have time-sensitive windows for learning languages? Do you see any parallels? Um, yeah, so I think, again, we only did this in three, I don't really know where to look, but I, yeah, we, um, we, we only managed to do this in three pups, and this is something that we need to do again to play around with this time window and see if there is this critical period. Um, I suspect that, that it might be slightly more flexible because we do see some plasticity in the adult during these queen transitions. Um, and so in, um, yeah, maybe you noticed in the slides that I showed, it seemed that when we moved the pups later in, in um, development, that they didn't learn as well. Um, but this is again only an N of three, so I think this is something that we need to test. Um, but I suspect that there will be some parallels. Great, thank you. Um, then we have uh, uh, one question by Christine. I would love to hear more about the random forest classifier. Is it a neural network? And how does the data set creation and training process work? Is it new that machine learning plays a role in your research? Um, well, yeah, I think so. Maybe this is an email, email me later and I can give you some, <laughs> some details, but just uh, generally, yeah, I think, um, so it is a neural net that we use um, partially, um, but uh, not not for the random forest classifier. We actually use like many different types of machine learning. And I think, um, the reason that we did this is we realized we had like a backlog of human processing capacity. <laughs> so when we and to really like, I mean, people have looked at this before and, and they just didn't manage to like process the same amount of data. So I think that really when you can train a computer to do something for you, that is a huge advantage. Um, and yeah, I um, I would be happy to chat more if, uh, if the person who asked the question wants to. Uh, I will just quickly um, read out uh, Aya Goldstein's um, question. Thanks for the great talk. Did you try to correlate between movement or average group size and calls interpulse intervals of different species? Is it possible that they also use these calls for orientation and animals that move or expect to meet more neighbors in the colony emit those co more calls? Sorry. Oh, um we haven't looked at any of that. I think those are all really fascinating questions. Um, uh, most of these uh, these interactions were done when we had a few um, animals together um, interacting, not the whole colony, um, because we had a bit of a yeah, triangulation issue. Um, for the other species, I think this is something that we can definitely um, do in the wild, which would be great. And so. Um, yeah, sorry, I have not a good answer for that, but I think those are all really good, uh, good questions. Yeah. Thank you so much. So I saw that um, Armin uh, kindly just typed in um, Alison's email in the chat. So whoever wishes to get in contact with her, please do so. Um, are there any more questions from the room, maybe? Now is still time. <laughs> um, Okay, does not look like it, but I think we had a great discussion here. And so thank you all again for uh, chiming in and coming to today's seminar. And uh, most of all to Alison for giving this wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you all. And Armin for hosting. <laughs>